We were not created to be optimists. We were created to be worshipers. Uh, in the quietness of my home, my, my Facebook feed blew up with optimism days before the turn of the new year. See you later, COVID. See you later, politics. See you later, 2020 and all your problems. And the turning of the calendar dates is going to make all that go away. And January 1st is going to bring a new normalcy. The entertainment's going to come back, movies and sports. We're going to better ourselves daily while leaving behind our personal vices. The anticipation of things opening back up and resuming life as normal, the optimism was ringing clear days before January 1st. Now, as part of the whole, Optimism is not a bad thing. But if it's the only guiding philosophy, it finds itself spewing out rhetoric that is not in tune with reality. And if it comes out of the wrong source, if my optimism comes out of my ability or others' abilities or chance or whatnot, then, then your only option is to be optimistic about how many times things worked out and then ignore the times when things did not work out. But even just this week, before I got to the events at the Capitol building, and one of sort of the news headlines that I got, these are the headlines that I read this week on January the, the 5th. That there was terrorism against Nigerian Christians. The, day, the church in Nigeria is being oppressed by, by terrorists from the outside. I, I read this week in the headlines that, it, that the California Insurance Commissioner clarified that insurance coverage on double mastectomies for gender dysphoric females is not a cosmetic surgery, but a reconstructive surgery, and did so by classifying normal breast tissue as abnormal structures of the body caused by congenital defects. A person, um, a person said that what has been created was abnormal. A congressman who is a pastor concluded a prayer with a man and a woman. There were more abortions in the world, a number exceeding 42 million. And that led all other leading causes of death. The next closest was communicable diseases at 13 million. By January 5th, my optimism had gone out the window. And the collective optimism of the world was insufficient to stand against these tragedies and confusions. So when January 6th came, and I get a text going, hey, are you watching? I got a text from my, from my, from my wife, hey, are you watching these things? And I had already been watching these things. And it was just another punch in the, in the optimistic gut that was vanishing faster than a New Year's diet. I called a prayer time for our church in part because I'm the pastor of the church and, and as one of the elders of the church and that we needed to respond to what was happening at our nation's capital by gathering and praying. But confessionally, church, confessionally, I just needed some brothers and some sisters to hold my hand and worship through prayer. I needed to hear others pray not out of unhinged self help, love me, some me, optimism that ignores reality, but I needed somebody to pray with me out of worship, but to worship out of faith, faith that is anchored in a revealed divine relationship with an almighty God of the universe. 
I need somebody to worship with me in prayer to the lamb who was slain on the cross for all sin, for all time. I need to worship with brothers and sisters by faith in the resurrected Messiah who ascended to the throne of God. I wanted to gather with brothers and sisters, even if it was just virtually, to, to pray in the hope of the returning king who will make a new heaven and a new earth secure perfectly in his presence with no need for optimism because all the promises of God will be fulfilled. Jesus himself said to Peter and James and John and Andrew, the rest of the disciples in John 14, he told them, he said, if I go, I will prepare a place for you and I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. This, this is who I wanted to be around. People who were worshiping the one who was and is and is to come. Worship. Now, if you have been with us the past two Sundays... You heard the word of God preached. I mean, preached once by Shannon Hurley out of SOS Ministries and once by Agardo Rosa, our minister of Christian education and missions. And, and Shannon brought us a word from, uh, from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And, and honestly, the thing that I took most from his sermon was the idea of not simply having a quiet time, uh, but that if we were able to run the race and fix our eyes on Jesus, then we must be at the feet of of Jesus daily in word and prayer to, to be in communion with the risen Savior by the power of the Spirit through word and prayer. To be at the feet of King Jesus. To be in his presence. Meeting face to face with God by the power of the Spirit. Oh, I needed to hear that, church. What Shannon could have just as easily have said was, it, uh, was, was worship God in the quietness of your heart, in the quietness of your home. Read his word and be silent at the foot of the throne and listen to what Jesus is saying to you through his word and then respond in praise and confession and gratitude and intercession on behalf of the saints. Leave, leave that place confident that God has your life and has all of life right there in the palm of his hands. And then, unintentionally, but very appropriately, and I'm sure by ultimate design, Edgardo preached that God was jealous for our worship out of Deuteronomy 28. Now, we're no longer talking about the, the individual, but the people of God gathering. And I left that service knowing that God is jealous for our worship precisely because he is the only one who is worthy of such worship. Jesus Christ is the object of our worship because nothing else and no one else is like him. He provides the means of our worship through joy and service and obedience. Then, staying anchored to the text, Edgardo concluded by teaching that God has provided a location for worship. Spiritually in the truth, spatially wherever the body is gathered, everlastingly in the new heavens, the new earth. Yes, God, God is jealous for our worship precisely because he's the only one worthy of our worship. And we can never be truly satisfied and happy if we are worshiping what is worthy. That's him. And in this life, we can only be truly happy if we're worshiping with the body as best we can. So, so the next five weeks, then, we're talking about worshiping in our location as a body of believers. And we are going to do this by talking about the Word of God and how we focus on it in our worship through reading the Word, singing the Word, praying the Word, preaching the Word, and seeing the Word. Now, I want to take a second, and I want to tell you how we sort of got here. Um, as you've come to our church you know that most of what our service has been is corporate singing and sermon. 
That, that's mostly what our service looked like on a Sunday morning. Just We sang uh, beautiful songs, worshipful songs, well-thought-out songs, and we preached a sermon, and we had uh, a little bit of prayer and, um, and, uh, and some announcements. That's basically what our service looked like for as long as I've been here. Oh, that worked until two months ago when we moved back inside and had some concern about COVID-19 in relationship to the science of how it spreads through singing. So we chose to incorporate different elements of worship at the beginning of our service so that those who were uncomfortable with singing could still attend a corporate gathering and then leave at the end when we did all of our singing. That's what's happened uh, since November. Now, since that time, we've gotten some positive feedback about the uh, times of directed prayer and responsive readings of the scriptures. Not, not overwhelming response, n- negative or positive, but a few positive remarks about the prayer time and the reading of the scriptures and, and the enjoyment of that. And, and, and then TJ had found and had me listen to a, a worship conference from a couple of years ago titled uh, Doxology and Theology, uh, which was exhorting pastors, the conference was for pastors, and it was ex- exhorting pastors to place the, pr- the five previous things that I just mentioned, reading, singing, praying, preaching, seeing, firmly on the foundation of the word and regularly use them in the worship service. Uh, so we decided... Right, uh, we, the, the staff and the elders, uh, to, to bring that conference to you in the form of our Sunday gathering uh, here on Sunday mornings. We're, uh, e- each week, I'm going to be preaching one of the four elements that was just mentioned. And next week, TJ is going to be preaching on singing the word. And so on Sundays, we'll be leaning heavily, the next five weeks, we're going to lean heavily on the material that was taught at the conference And then we're going to actually share a link with you to the actual conference if you'd like to hear the original lecture. We'll do that on Tuesdays in the From the Pastor. And the question that we're trying to answer is this. What will our worship regularly look like when the restrictions are lifted and we can all get back to the same building at the same time or potentially when we head back outside and there's uh, room for enough people to meet? Our first thought at this point is not to go back uh, to six songs in a sermon, but to continue to use directed prayers and responsive readings in the context of song and sermon, and, and then also to take the Lord's Supper on a weekly basis from the month of February uh, through the month of May. And, the, and this whole time, while, we're, while these, these five weeks and the time that we sort of, however we have to adjust our service in the right times the right ways, The elders want to hear from you, Um, but not only hear your preferences, we want to hear what you think in light of what you learn over the next five weeks and what you experience over the next five months. And we want to hear how it connects what you're experiencing, what it connects with what we're doing in the context of our worship service. So I want you to be sure to make it a priority Right? Not just because of the sermon series, but because of what the Lord commands us to do. Like, you need to attend. You need to not grow weary of watching it online. You need, you need to, to participate with this. And, and take some notes. And think carefully and prayerfully about the teachings that we're offering. And we will either use a... Con- somewhere in the future, in, in, in maybe June or, 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 or July or sometime, sometime uh, we will use a congregational meeting or, or another specific gathering to have a family discussion about what we've experienced over the last few months and ask the Lord to show us the best way forward. I would ask you if that makes sense, but you're not here to tell me yes, so I'll trust that it does. <laughs> So with all that being said, hopefully that catches you up. We're trying to worship. We're not trying to be optimistic. We're trying to worship King Jesus together in the best way we know how. So let's take a look at the idea that reading the word corporately is a right practice for the gathered body of the church, right? The the responsive readings that we're doing. So uh, this uh, this comes out of, uh, of a talk given by Legan Duncan, a chancellor and CEO of Reformed Theological Seminary. And in his talk from Doxology and Theology Conference in 2018, he said that Christian worship is a word-mediated encounter 
between the congregation and the living God. And then he posed this question, how do you worship a living God? How do you worship spirit, right? God. And with dry wit, he answered his own question by saying, however it is that he tells you. Now, the wit is true. If God tells us to worship him in a certain way or by certain means, then we definitely ought to do it. So there's sort of one key verse that seems to sum up the practice that we see throughout the scriptures about reading the word corporately. And it comes from 1 Timothy chapter 4. And this is what it says. Paul, writing to Timothy, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhorting and to teaching. So there seems to be a couple ways to understand this particular verse. Uh, you can either uh, say that they're only reading the passage of text that the preacher plans to exhort and teach from, or... You can sort of interpret by saying that we are to be reading a steady diet of scriptures and exhorting and teaching from some of them. So I want to walk through a few other passages, Old and New Testament, to see if we can sort of collectively see what the Bible is asking us to do when we gather to worship King Jesus. Uh, I want to start in Exodus chapter 24, uh, verses 3 and 4 and 7, and this is what the Lord is teaching us. It says, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain and the 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. They sacri uh, this is where they sacrifice a bunch of offerings. And it says, And then they took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be obedient. So what you see here is Moses getting the law and telling the people, Here's all the words of the Lord. And what do people do? We, the Lord's spoken and we'll do it. We'll be obedient. What, what's the response of the people to the reading of the Word of God? Obedience, which is worship unto the Lord. Again, in Deuteronomy, uh, before the people are to go to the promised land, it reads this. Then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, at the same time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourners within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of this law and that their children who have known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. Again, so the people are to hear the law of the Lord read in its entirety once every seven years, so the younger generations will hear the law in its entirety, which is both teaching and accountability. And the assumption is there's sanctification and remembrance for those who have heard it before. Why? Well, so that they will know how to worship the Lord by believing in the God of the covenant, and then following him in obedience, worshiping with their life. They're reading all the word for teaching and encouragement and worship. So they, they cross the Jordan, they conquer the land, and, and then the book of Joshua, chapter 8, it seems like the same pattern's going over. The people have crossed into the promised land. Joshua builds an altar just as the Lord had commanded in the law. They offer burnt offerings and peace offerings. And then the, the, 
that in the presence of all Israel, Joshua wrote on stones a copy of God's law. And the people stood on either side of the Ark of the Covenant as the Levitical priests blessed the people of Israel. And then the scripture says in Joshua 8, 34 and 35, and afterwards he, Joshua, read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. Now, church, every time that I see a new generation hearing the word of God in the Bible, it reminds me that this is also uh, the universal church's calling as well as our own local body's calling. We have to tell the next generation who this God is who loves them and who saves them and who keeps his promises. It's God's people declaring God's truth to the nations, teaching the next generations the law of the Lord that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Listen, you can do this in a lot of ways. You can do this by going overseas someplace and declaring it literally to the nations, even as our church sends people out to do such things, and we send our own people out to go support those people, right? Those missionaries. Uh, you could do this locally by serving in our summer missions. When we do our basketball camps, our vacation Bible schools, you can come and you can tell the next generation about the laws of God and the, and, and the fulfillment of those laws in the person of Jesus Christ and how we live by grace through faith alone. Uh, parents, you can do this in your parenting. Uh, there's... I think there's very little question that when we resume as normal, there's going to be some child care for your little ones. That's during the time of the service, so you can actually take the service in. However, parents, you need to be parenting and need to be cons prayerfully considering when it is that your children are going to be discipled through the Sunday morning service through the things that we sing and pray and read so that they can hear the truths of God from, from another place of position of the church. We, we are a church who is living on mission. Do not stop doing this. And the way that our church can, can grow in serving out this mission is by continuing to read passages of Scripture to one another in the context of our body. Anybody who comes into our church won't simply hear the sermon, good or bad, but they just hear the words of God, which are powerful. Let's keep going. Uh, 2 Chronicles 34. Uh, under King Josiah, we just read this together, right? We just, this is the big passage we just read just a few minutes ago. King Josiah, Hilkiah is repairing the house of the Lord, the temple. They're busy distributing money to the workmen to complete their tasks. While this happens, Hilkiah discovers the word of the Lord, a, a book of the law the Lord had given through Moses. Hilkiah gives it to, to Shaphan, and Shaphan reported to the king uh, how the renovation was going on the temple, and then uh, has sort of a show and tell about the word of God that they found, that Hilkiah found. And so Shaphan begins to read it to King Josiah. And after, and when, when Josiah hears it, he tears his clothes in repentance for not keeping the word of God. And then he gives this command, which we just read, go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. He's, King Josiah is all kinds of messed up because the people have not heard the word of God and they're not obeying the word of God. And after hearing a word of mercy from the Lord through the prophetess Huldah, Josiah called all the elders of Jerusalem and Judah together and all the people great and small. And, and this, is what, this is what he said. This is, what it, this is what the Bible says that he did. Josiah read in their hearing 
all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. Then he made all who were present in Jerusalem and in Benjamin join in it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. The word of God in Josiah's day is nowhere to be found. Then it's discovered and then it's read unto private repentance of the king and then it's read unto public renewal of the covenant of God with his people. The word of God brings about repentance and renewal. Uh, if, you, if you take the time uh, to listen to the lecture that will get sent out on Tuesday, you'll hear this story. If you don't, then you'll hear it now. Because a, a pastor of a, of a congregation, this is a real true story, read Genesis chapter 1 as part of their Bible reading in the church service. And an officer in the church, an elder or a deacon or some sort of person in the church, but somebody who had been attending the church for a long time and who, who professed Christianity, right? He'd been there for many, many years and he heard the words, but he heard the words of Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created. And immediately, this man fell under conviction that he did not actually believe in the creator God of the universe, and he was convicted that if he did not believe in this creator God, then he could not believe in the rest of the claims of the Bible, including Jesus Christ. So he repented of his unbelief and got saved because somebody read out loud Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. And, and later on, someone asked the guy, he says, hey, I heard you got saved under pa Pastor Glenn's teaching. And the guy very quickly replied, no. I got saved before the sermon. He heard the word of God and got saved. Now listen, I, I'm fully aware this is an exceptional story, right? Uh, I am not teaching this morning that if we start reading chunks of scripture publicly that people are going to get saved in droves. This is why we should do it. That's not what I'm teaching. But what I am saying, and what I do believe, is that we serve an exceptional God whose word is exceptionally powerful. In fact, powerful unto salvation. And reading it corporately in our church can only bear the right kind of fruit for our body. The, fruit, the fruit of repentance for those who are lost and, and, the, and, and even the fruit, of, uh, the fruit of repentance for those who are, who are uh, living in sin and, and then all the fruits of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, against these things, there's no law. Only good can come out of reading more Scripture in the context of our services. Uh, uh, the last, uh, last Old Testament passage, uh, just for real brief uh, it's, uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, they come back from the exile and Ezra opens the book, uh, chapter verse 5 and 6, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was above all the people and as he opened it, all, all the people stood and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God and all the people answered him, amen and amen, lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Uh, this doesn't seem like a sermon. This doesn't seem like worship music. This doesn't seem like a prayer time. This looks like the reading of the word took place. People stood up in honor of the presence of the Lord through the reading of the word. They responded to it by saying amen and amen and then they then they bowed their heads and worshiped with their faces to the ground because the word was read. Seems like a pretty good idea. Seems like even more than an idea, it seems like the right response to being in the presence of the holy God by the power of his spirit through the reading of his word. So we get then to the New Testament. 
And, and because of the way the people of God worked in the Old Testament, it was then customary in the Jewish synagogues for the rabbis to open up a scroll and to read from it and then explain it to the people. Uh, Jesus did this in Luke 4 when he read Isaiah in the temple and then told them that the prophecy was fulfilled in their presence on that day. This is typical. This is, what, this is the way it functioned. And, and then the book of Acts seems to carry this along for us, right? So Acts, uh, Acts 13, uh, verse 27 says, For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him or understand the utterance of the, of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him for Jewish worship, they are, uh, for, for, sorry, for the Jew, uh, uh, sorry, uh, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. So for, the, for Jewish worship then, they're reading each week the utterances of the prophets, yet they do not recognize that Jesus is the fulfillment of those things. But their practice is to read the prophets. Uh, again, in Acts 15, uh, it, says, it says, James to the Jerusalem council, Right, He's reading to the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. He says, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from them the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So James is telling the early church, do not trouble the Gentiles with all of the ritual laws of the Jews, but write the things they are to follow in order to prevent them from being a stumbling block to the Jews and for other unbelieving Gentiles. And as these laws that are written for the Gentiles, and they're written down, go in line with Moses' law, which are read weekly in the synagogue in every city, they'll be reminded of who they are to be and what they are to do as Gentile people. Paul extends this in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. He says, And when the when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of, La- of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Now, Paul's letter is to be read in the church, carrying with it the apostolic authority of Paul, later recognized as God's word. He does it again in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 27. He says, I put you under oath, like he's commanding it before the Lord, to have this letter read to all the brothers. So, so some, some could argue that Paul understands what he's writing are the words of God. Some would argue that Paul doesn't really know that, but he knows what's being said is important and for the furtherance of the church. But either way, he's putting them under oath that his letter is to be read to all the churches, to all the brothers. So this wouldn't just simply be like a one-time letter. This is not like getting your electric bill in the mail. You're like, Bill, I'll pay it, throw it away. This is more like an instructional book. This is more like a, a, a love letter that for different reasons and different times, you would read it over and over and over and over and over and over again. It warms our hearts. It exhorts us to obey. It gives us the picture of who Jesus Christ is and what his church is about. We read the Bible. Uh, One last thing from uh, from antiquity. That's that's the scriptures I have for you this morning. But I'll give you one from the early church. Justin Martyr, uh, a second century philosopher, converted to Christianity. He just describes what a worship service is like in the second century. On a day called Sunday, all who lived in the cities or the country gathered together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read for as long as time permits. Then, when the reader has ceased, 
the overseer instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. So, so what you see there then is a quantity of Scripture read, and you see a teaching of the Scriptures. So, so what you have here then is biblical precedent and historical practice. You have all the law being read at different times, leading us to think that we should read more of the Bible corporately than just the sermon text. Uh, you're, you're, it's taking place on the Sabbath, every Sabbath. What comes from it is obedience that is worship. You, you are in his presence as the Holy Spirit guides you into all truth by the reading of his word. You, you may even have one other way that someone could come to Christ in the context of your worship service. Our aim is to have a service, to have a Sunday morning service that's centered on Christ through His Word. We've not, we've not been neglectful in that, but we're also discovering by Word itself and by practice in our context that there may be even a better way to do it than how we have been doing it. Our worship service aim is to be theologically robust and outwardly celebratory as every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And without turning our service into a, a free-for-all to do whatever we want to do, we, we want our service to be as participatory as is reasonable. Uh, Ligon Duncan argues that, to, that, you are, that you ought to grow your church to a place where you read large passages of Scripture in a systematic way where you get through the entire Bible or the large portions of Scriptures over time. My personal opinion is that, is that our direction is a little bit different. That the sermon passage is the central text for that, for that particular Sunday and, and as we preach the Word of God, that should be taking our congregation through books of the Bible. But we should be adding supporting texts from both Testaments that should be used in a corporate and responsive way so that we are unified before God in our public confession of who He is and what He's done for us. That's why the responsiveness of it seems to be relatively important to us. That's sort of the first thoughts. There's lots of conversation to have. There's lots of more study to do. But, but the word of God being read to the people of God is beyond simply reading the sermon text seems to be of great import. Again, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Until I come... Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Why should we do it this way? Because optimism will not work. But worship through God's holy word, that will sustain you forever.